which is uh, which is going to be delivered by me. Uh, this is an uh, introductory, uh, very introductory course to uh, to programming in OpenFOAM. Uh, it's always it's always been a bit difficult to work out how best to pitch um, a, a programming course for OpenFOAM. So we're never quite sure uh, how much experience people will have. Uh, I mean, based on the uh, the quick quiz that Daniela did with you all on uh, on Monday. It sounds like the majority of you have a little bit of experience with open phone, but not a not a huge amount. So, um, so I'm going to assume that you you haven't really done any programming within open phone, uh, and so we're gonna we're gonna build from the ground up. Uh, hopefully, for those of you that that have some experience within programming, um, you will uh, you, there'll still be some some useful nuggets that you can you can pick up from this. So, uh, hopefully, you have been able to uh, to download. <laughs> the guide from, um, from the Dropbox. So what I've done is I have, if I share my screen with you. Um, so we have um, programming and open foam and introduction. Uh, this is a course I gave, um, a similar to a course I gave about 18 months ago at the, uh, at the second open foam um, Second open phone course back in uh, back in 2019. Uh, when I delivered that, it was face to face, and there were about 20 people all sat around computers. So I have made some changes to try and help deliver this course online. Um, so I'll give you a brief introduction. So um, as as you all know already, open foam is an open source toolbox, and it's it's already got a wide range of solvers and uh, and functionality already built into it. Uh, and many users uh, who are familiar with this, this huge range of models and libraries, may, they may never need to code anything in OpenFOAM uh, for what they want to do. But um, that being said, being able to develop and implement new models and solvers and libraries and integrate them within, uh, within OpenFOAM's environment allows researchers and practitioners to get, get a lot more of, uh, out of their work. Now, as, uh, as some of the speakers have already alluded to so far, I know Gavin was talking about this a little bit on Wednesday, uh, open foam is it is written um, based on the object oriented C++ language and so users of C++ will be will be familiar with a lot of the concepts uh, that we talk about today including things like polymorphism and inheritance and also um, the idea of classes um, these concepts are used a lot in open foam to try and reduce code duplication and to improve the efficiency uh, however uh, the important thing to note and this is I think I think Gavin said this as well is that um, a lot of the functionality in C++ has been overloaded in OpenFOAM. And so in some sense, OpenFOAM can be thought of as its, as its own language, although that language does derive from, from C++. One way to think about it might be to think about it in terms of being a, um, a high order version of C++ with a lot more functionality built in. So what are we going to do in this course? So we're going to introduce some of the elements of OpenFOAM programming. Uh, we're going to start with the basics of compiling and basic arithmetic and also introduce some of the core classes. Um, we then in lesson two, we're going to create a, a utility and look at concepts like data access. And we're also going to look at some ideas around um, efficiency within programming and what to look out for and what to try and avoid. And then hopefully we'll get a chance to look at lesson three, where we're going to make a modification to a solver to develop a new solver that has some improved functionality. So each of the three lessons contains uh, a number of examples and the codes are provided for each of these. Uh, hopefully you've been able to, um, to download those. Um, I, I'm assuming that you've got a basic understanding of programming here in terms of the, the basic concepts of compilation and, and code blocks, uh, but I'm not assuming that you've done any programming with OpenFOAM before. Uh, just a quick note for, for when you're trying to interpret some of the codes. So OpenFOAM uses the same um, conventions, which I've spelt wrong, uh, a C++. So lines are ended with a semicolon and comments are written with, um, with two forward slashes. And blocks of code are opened and closed with, um, with curly brackets. So let's get started with lesson one. So in this lesson, we're just going to introduce the basics of, uh, of programming with OpenFOAM and look at the structure of a program. We're going to look at, at, at the compiler and, uh, and some of OpenFOAM's core classes. By the end of this, hopefully you'll have some familiarity with what a program in OpenFOAM looks like and a bit of data input and output and using some of the existing classes within OpenFOAM. So the first thing to note with regards to the compiler is this caused no end of trouble when I, I tried to deliver the course a couple of years ago. 
Uh, the compiler that OpenFoam has, um, when you when you install OpenFoam, it comes ready with this in the uh, in the bundle is WMake. Now it, it's similar to CMake, but it's not the same as CMake. And um, I, I must recommend, I highly recommend that you use WMake um, for compilation. I know people tend to like to use um, compilers that they're familiar with. Um, you're going to reduce the risk of errors and uh, compilation and interpretation problems if you do use WMake. So I, I really would recommend that you use that. And that's what we'll be using throughout this. So the first thing is when we create a new program or a, a new class or function, we would normally create uh, the program in a folder which has the same name as that program. And we're going to use that throughout this course. And then when compiling that code, you should always run from inside that folder as sort of the root folder, not its subfolders. Uh, Daniela or Luofeng, somebody's asked for the link to the Dropbox to be shared. Could you dig that out? One of you? Yeah, um, I, will do, I will be doing this. Uh, great, thank you. Apologies for those of you who haven't been able to get that. So um, we're going to work through all the examples and you're going to see the code here anyway. So hopefully, um, hopefully that won't be a problem. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to introduce some of the basic concepts and we're going to use the C++ standard library. And we're going to write a simple program, compile it using WMake and execute it. What we're then going to do is we're going to write the same program, but instead of using C++ libraries, we're going to use the open phone libraries. What I'm trying to do here is to just explain the relationship between C++ and open phone so you can get an understanding of where the similarities lie, but also where you should use uh, open phones specific classes rather than those of C++'s standard library. So for those of you that have got everything installed and, uh, and up and running, you might want to, to follow along with this. Um, so the first thing we're going to do is we're going to create an example called example one. So if I share my other screen with you, which hopefully you can also see, so you would just go into your terminal and you would write make directory example one. Now I've already created that and it's sat in here. And we've got um, we've got two things here. So you can see example one, which is just the code that I've shown on the um, on the screen. So I'll talk through this code. So for those of you who are really aren't familiar with any of this, to, just to try and give you a brief idea of the the ingredients of, of a program within open phone. So the first thing we've got on line one is uh, include IO stream. Now, when we include files, you'll see this a lot at the start and you often see quite a big list of include files. This is code that already exists. It, it's code that's already compiled using, um, and it's, it's usually referencing uh, libraries that already exist. And by writing it in like this, we're, we're reducing code duplication. So IO stream is something we use all the time, or when, when we see the, um, the open phone version of this, you'll see that it's slightly different. And so we put this at the start, and this gives us access to a load of functionality associated with, uh, with input and output. Now we're going to declare the program, which we generally call for this sort of thing, we'll just call it main, being the main program, and we declare it as an integer which means we need to return an integer at the end. You'll also sometimes see um, a program declared as void, so V-O-I-D. And in that case, we have no return. Uh, there is uh, something useful with using returns. You might wonder why we would want to, but for a very complex program, we can use this uh, to help with things like error handling. So we can have different return codes. And if certain something goes wrong within a program, when we write our program, we can write, say, return two if some, a certain error occurs or return three. And this can help people to understand where their code might be going wrong. So we're just declaring here integer and integer. And we're just going to declare it as five and double, so pi. So integers are, are obvious and, and doubles refer to um, uh, any, any real number, really. Um, double precision uh, is, is generally used. And then we're just going to output some simple arithmetic. So we're going to do a plus pi is a plus pi. And we're using this C out. Now C out is, uh, is why we've used this IO stream. And, uh, and then you'll notice here there's this namespace standard. 
And I talk about that here. So namespaces are important in large complex programs to avoid naming conflict. So we might have more than one compiled function with the same name. So in this case, it's C out. So in many applications, and we're going to see an example of this uh, later on in the course, where you would have more than one function with the same name. And so we can use namespaces to differentiate. So we could have also written this as standard and then double colon C out. But because we only use the namespace standard, it's easier to declare that at the start. And then we use these brackets, C out. And, uh, and we're just using some simple arithmetic here with uh, slash N being a new line, which is common to a lot of languages. So if we then go into here, what we can do is in order to compile this, what we would do is we would type W make files and options. Now this is a utility that exists within OpenFoam. And what that does is it's going to create a directory called make. So if we go into make, we can see there's two files, files and options. Files is just saying, what are we going to compile and where are we going to put it? So we're compiling a program called example1.c. It's an executable and we want to put it in the foam user app bin. Now, when we run wmake files and options, it will just put foam app bin, which is the location of the source code. Now, just as a point of good programming practice here, I would recommend that you save your, uh, your own code and you compile your own code to a different location than, um, than the open foam source code. It's just good practice to avoid any, any major mishaps. And so it's better to just put user in here. So you'll notice when you create WMake files and options, it will just look like that. And so I would recommend that you just add foam user bin. And then to compile this code, you just type WMake. And you can see it compiles there. There's no red appearing, which means there's no errors, which is good. And then if we just want to run this code, we just type the name of it, example one, and it runs. So we have some basic arithmetic, five plus pi and five times pi, and it returns those to the screen. And that was our C out being used. So hopefully that was, um, that was very straightforward for you. Um, too straightforward, I'm sure for many of you. Um, but what I now want to do is introduce that same example using, uh, so this is just stuff that we've already covered. Um, what we're now going to do is we're going to do the same thing, but we're going to use OpenFoam's overwritten version of C++, if you like. So for those of you that are following along with this, uh, make a new folder called example two. And, uh, and go into this folder and create a new code using a text editor of your choice, call it example2.c. And you can see that a lot of this is, uh, is very similar. It's got the same number of lines. It's got roughly the same number of, uh, of everything in it. But there's some, there's some important differences. So the first one is OpenFoam has a, a, a new header file. It has its own header file for input output streaming. And, uh, and one of the key differences, a very important difference for CFD applications is, uh, is this all works in parallel and this all has um, parallel options. And instead of the standard namespace, what we're going to use this time is we're going to use namespace foam. We start again, we use our in main, so we're going to declare a function called main. And this time we're going to replace integer and double with label and scalar. So label is, uh, is the open phone version in many ways of an integer. And scalar is similar to double, but open phone being open phone, um, these, these functions have uh, a lot more functionality built into them, um, a lot more member functions and usability, and they're designed to be used in a much more mathematical way. And again, we'll, we'll see that in the next example. Now, instead of using C out, uh, which we used when we used the standard library, we are going to use um, info, which is perhaps a slightly more obvious uh, term to use, but then the rest of the terminology is exactly the same. So it's info and then, um, and then these symbols, and again, some basic arithmetic and, uh, and everything else is the same. So we go into that again, for those of you running along with this, you're gonna use the WMake files and options. 
that's going to make your make file. And again, in, um, in files, change this to user. Uh, oh, I've just realized I haven't told you about the other file within, so um, within make. So the other thing that's within make is, uh, is options. And this contains information about uh, dependencies and where it should get different libraries from. Uh, if you go into some of the more complex examples, for example, um, things for utilities and solvers, you'll notice there's a lot more dependencies here of libraries and different information that, um, that will be picked up. So again, we can compile our code using wmake. And hopefully it will work with no errors. Excellent. And again, we can run the code simply by typing example two. And we notice it's exactly the same as example one. So all I was trying to do there is introduce how open foam is, is similar to C++, but also how it's different and, and to try and get you to see that um, the most of the standard libraries that you see in C++, there will be an equivalent library within open foam, which has significantly extended functionality. And it's generally better to use those. So as I say, open foam's uh, classes have been developed to handle parallel computations, which obviously is, is very important for, I imagine, almost all of your work. So let's move on to the next example. Uh, so in the previous example, I, 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 I talked briefly about the idea of a class, but I never really define what a class is. It, it's a slightly odd thing to describe. Uh, I've seen many different descriptions in books that make, make more or less sense. Here's, here's my effort at describing what a class is for those of you that don't know. So it's broadly a construct that holds information in a structured way, and it has attributes and functionality that can be, it can be very simple or it can be very complicated. So for example, we use the class Scalar, which is an open phone core class, and that's a construct that allows us to work with scalars and their associated functionality, such as addition and multiplication. So for those of you that are mathematicians, um, you could perhaps think of it like, uh, like a group or uh, uh, in that it's a, uh, it's a, uh, an object that then has additional attributes and additional functionality. So when we work with classes, we create an object that is of a given class. And using the previous example, we created an object called uh, A, and that was of a given class label. So when we want to use that, we refer to A, not the class name. So when we create the object, we have to tell the compiler what that object is. So it's a class label. But then when we want to use it again, we just say A. So in later sections, we're going to see classes that have member functions, and that greatly enhances the useful of classes and, and object-oriented program in general. And those of you that are familiar with, uh, with object-oriented program will be, will be well-versed in all of this, I'm sure. So in the, in the previous section, we introduced two classes, label and scalar, and they were alternatives to, uh, to integer and double. And so the reason we do that is by using OpenFoam's core classes, it's possible to perform uh, vector and tensor algebra and also vector and tensor calculus in, uh, in a more intuitive and mathematical way. And two classes that we will frequently use when working with uh, multidimensional problems are the vector and tensor classes. Now, as they are, these are only valid for three-dimensional data and are primarily for data of the type, um, so some, some parameter uh, x, y, z being x, y, z being the, um, the spatial directions. And that, that's generally how um, the vector and tensor classes are used uh, within OpenFOAM. And by using these, we can perform um, algebra and calculus uh, without needing to use element-wise operations. And this makes your code much easier to write. It makes it much easier for you to read, for other people to read. And it, and it helps you just avoid uh, pointless errors and, um, and stress. So uh, operators like um, addition and multiplication, um, they've been overloaded within OpenFOAM to allow you to do this. And so example three, um, we're gonna see how that works. So again, for those of you uh, following along, uh, create a new code called, uh, a new folder called example three, and we're gonna create the code below. So again, we're gonna include our IO streams for input and output. But this time we're also going to include uh, another header file called field types. And that just contains all the dependencies associated with vectors and tensors and, um, 
and the core field classes. Again, we're using namespace foam and we're starting by declaring our integer function called main. So again, we're declaring a scalar, a is 5.2. I'm going to declare a vector and the notation we do that is by saying vector and the name of it. Then we open a bracket, we put in our three numbers, close the bracket. Tensors are declared just by a list of nine numbers, so for a three by three tensor. And then we're going to perform some um, some vector operations and, and uh, tensor operations, just so you can see uh, see how this works and see how it works in a, a non-element wise operation. So vector multiplied by a scalar, and this this follows all the usual mathematical rules. So uh, the compiler will get cross with you if you try and violate um, vector calculus or vector uh, operations. So for, for example, if you try and multiply things together that can't be multiplied together, or if you try and do double inner products on inappropriate tensors, then it, it, it will get cross with you. So for example, the sum of two vectors, there's no need for element-wise operation. We just simply say n plus n. Similarly, there's dot products, uh, so inner product in that case. Uh, and for that, we use the and. And a tensor times a vector, we also use an and being, being broadly an inner product operation that reduces the, um, the rank of the highest order tensor by one. Uh, something to note here, and this is a quirk of C++, uh, for those of you, when you work with the AND operation for an inner product or a, a double inner product, if it's uh, double AND, you'll need to use brackets because, uh, and this is an issue of precedence, which I, I talk about here. So uh, in, a, in, a, in C++, the output operator takes precedence over the AND operator. And so if you don't use brackets, what the compiler will do is it will read all of this out. And then if there were no brackets here, it would output M and N as they are without evaluating them. And so it would give you, uh, give you garbage. And so you just need to remember that when you're using this operation, anywhere near this operation to use brackets to make sure this is evaluated prior to this. And then again, we're just gonna return zero. So if we go into our example three, you can see the code here exactly as it was written. We have our W make files and options again. So you can see we have our nano, uh, we have make files again, storing it in the user app bin. And we can compile that in exactly the same way. I hope with no errors. Excellent. And we can run this in exactly the same way as we've run the previous one. And we can see it's performed our vectors, uh, vector operations and tensor operations, and it outputs them in the appropriate format. So we can see that that's a lot easier than just doing this in a normal, the sort of lower level C++, uh, in that we have to do a lot less typing, uh, which means it's a lot easier to read, it's a lot easier to write, and it's a lot easier to debug. So moving on, is my screen still sharing? Uh, sorry, Luofeng or Daniela, is my screen still sharing the uh, PDF document? Yeah. yeah, I see the PDF. Yeah, right, sorry, it's telling me it's not. Okay, fine, <laughs> not a problem. Right, so um, we'll move on to the next example. So for storing large uh, and processing uh, large amounts of data, we tend to use the list and field class. Now, again, for those of you familiar with C++, this, this won't be new to you, but list is actually uh, something called a uh, template class. Uh, and it actually inherits the functionality depending on what the list is made up of. So we might have a list of scalars, which would just be an n by one list, or we might have a list of vectors, which is of the form shown here. And when we do that, we inherit all of the functionality associated with a vector. So for example, if we have a list of vectors, we may add those vectors, we may multiply those vectors by tensors in much the same way we did before. So the functionality associated with, the, um, with that class is inherited when we have a list of those things. So let's just see an example of how we might use the list class. Um, so I've, I've just got quite a simple example here, but it, it, it highlights the key points quite nicely. So we're gonna do a finite, uh, a finite sum we're going to create a finite sequence and we're going to store the results of each iteration in a list. So we're going to just try and evaluate this finite sum. 
which is a convergent sum and equals two as n goes from one to infinity. We're going to introduce a convergence criteria to stop the calculation once a certain level of convergence has been reached. And this just provides an opportunity to introduce some of the, um, of the member functions of lists. So I talked before about a class having a member function. So that's a function that belongs to a particular class. So the functions here we're going to use are size, a last, and append. And they're member functions of the class list. And they've been developed because they're useful things that you might want to do with a list. So for example, size, it tells you how many elements are in your list. Last returns what the last element in that list is. And append is where, say if we have a list with 10 elements, we can use the append operator to create a new list with 11 elements to add something new on. Now to use the, um, the functions within this, we use the dot operator. So if we have a list called my list, which we're going to create in the example, we can find out the size of that list by just using my list dot size. You'll note that we've got some parentheses here, and that's because member functions may have inputs. Uh, if they don't have an input, we just use the parentheses with nothing in them. And that's telling the compiler that we wish to invoke the member function size on the class, on the object named my list. And, we're, and obviously my list must be of, cla um, of class list. So let's have a look at this. Let's create uh, a new example called example four. And I'll uh, again, I'll, I'll, I'll talk you through this again, just more for the benefit of those that, that have not much familiarity with this, just so you can see what each of these steps is doing. So again, we've got our IO streams. This is our input and output operations. We're going to create, we're going to include the header file for list so that uh, we can use all the functionality associated with list. And I've just included math.h because, yeah, because I have the, that's for the um, power. Um, operation down here. So initially we're going to declare a list and because list is a templated class we need to say a list of what. So here we have list of scalars, we might also have a list of vectors, we might have a list of lists, uh, which so we could have a list of list of scalars and so on and this can all get very elaborate depending on what you're doing. And we're going to use a simple class constructor here where we just declare a list with a single value. So at the moment it's just a single number. And we're going to set the first value of that, which is uh, which is indexed with zero. Note that uh, again, we're adopting the, uh, the C++ notation that uh, indexing starts with zero, not one. Um, and we're going to introduce a, a convergence criteria, which is going to allow us to make sure that this thing doesn't go on forever. So we're using a while loop. So while our convergence value is greater than our convergence criterion, we're going to keep going. So we're going to declare each time a new value. And that's just the evaluation of the sum here, 1 over 2n, as n increases. And here we're using this member function called append. So what that does is uh, each time it, it evaluates this new value, which is uh, one over two to the n, and it's going to append that value to the new list. And then we're going to compute the total because we're trying to compute a sum. And here I've introduced this idea of, uh, of compound uh, assignments, which is plus equals. And this simply means the total is equal to the, to the previous total plus this new value. And again, I'm using another member function here, which is last. So it's my list dot last, which is the value which just created with the append here. We're then going to compute the convergence value to check what's changed and to check if we need to stop. Once the convergence value has been reached, it's going to jump out of this loop and it's going to repeat the list and tell us what that sum is. So it's fairly straightforward, but it introduces some of the key ideas to you. So if we go into example four, you can see the code here, which is exactly what I've just shown you. Again, using the W make files and options, we will create our make, which has our files and options in it. And we'll compile that code. 
And in order to run that, we shall just type example four. And there it is. So you can see we have a list. The first thing it tells us is how many elements are in that list. It's 18 and here it is. So this is simply our, our, um, our, our sequence. And then it's added them up. And you can see that the answer is very, very close to two. So hopefully that's that, that's fairly straightforward how that all works. Um, now, the, the extension of the, the list class is something you'll see frequently when you're working with OpenFOAM, and that is the, the field class. Now, this inherits a lot of the functionality of lists, but it also includes field algebra. And so we generally have a field, we might have a scalar field or vector field for velocity, for example, and that will be associated with a mesh. And that allows us to do all of our field algebra and calculus. And we'll see, we'll see an example of that later. So uh, that ends the first, uh, the first lesson. Hopefully that's introduced some of the main concepts to you. I might just try and go through a couple of the questions before we move on to the next lesson. So in the version of OpenFOAM that I'm using, there's no such command wmake files and options. Um, Lu Feng or Daniela, uh, can I ask which version of OpenFOAM you're using and do you have this function or not? Um, the w I don't make. think so. No, I, I, right, okay, I perhaps should give a brief. Um, so these uh, programs were written using the uh, foundation version of OpenFOAM. They have all been in compiled and tested in version uh, 18.12 and also uh, 19.06, I believe. Uh, I didn't realize that WMake files and options is a um, a uh, foundation specific thing. So briefly, I will um, I'll go back into example one. For those of you that cannot use WMake files and options, what this does is it creates a directory called Make, which you can see in the bottom left of my screen here. And if we go into make, what it's done is it's created these two files, files and options. This, this would not normally be there. This is created by the compiler. If we go into files, what it does is it creates, um, it will automatically put example one here, because when you run W make files and options, you would do it from the root directory example one. So it, it looks for any C files within there, calls it example one. Uh, so it, they're only very short files. So for those of you who it hasn't written them for you, um, this is all it's doing. And then it's creating an executable, locating it in your uh, user at bin called example one. Similarly, options is fairly straightforward. This is simply information about the dependencies. Um, for those of you that, that don't have the option to run WMake files and options, um, my recommendation would be to uh copy and paste something that is you know is very similar and then and then make any changes that you need to make these are just templates so you often have to add to these anyway um hopefully that won't cause people too many problems so another question i've got is uh where do we find documentation for open phone classes uh right i am hoping to go into this at the end um, and we'll look at some of the open foam documentation that's available. Uh, all of it's online. If you go either to uh, the ESI version of open foam or uh, CFD.direct, which is the foundation version, uh, all of the, uh, or indeed the Doxygen uh, documentation, uh, you can get all the information on the core classes in terms of class constructors and also um, all of the member functions and the inherited functionality from. Um, from classes that they inherit functionality from. Uh, hopefully we'll have time at the end uh, to go through some of those things. Uh, finally, another question, can we use alternative editors like uh, gedit, like Nano? Uh, yeah, any, any text editor you like. Uh, you've noticed I, I, in, my, um, in my PDF, I've, I've screenshotted um, gedit uh, files, but uh, I'm actually using Nano here. Yeah, Nano, Atom, uh, gedit, any any such thing uh, you like, whatever you prefer, it, it doesn't it doesn't matter at all. They're just you know no notepad if if you want it, it doesn't matter. Uh, what matters is you save them in the correct format, so .c or .h. Uh, 
and that it, all the um, the notation is correct. So uh, let's move on to the next lesson. So it's going to get a little little bit tricky now for those of you that haven't haven't worked with this before. Uh, so we're going to look at creating utilities and uh, and accessing data. So utility is a program that performs a specific task. So you'll all have used these and you've seen many of them throughout the last few days. So block mesh, set fields, uh, check mesh. These are all utilities that are frequently used as part of pre-processing. And we would generally write something that performs a specific task in a specific way. So in this lesson, we're going to see how utilities fit into the open frame framework and we're going to see how they're written. Now, another important part of programming within open phone programming generally that we're going to use uh, and learn a bit more about in this um, in this lesson is, is data access. So we need to be able to access data to read information about the mesh and access fields uh, such as pressure and velocity fields in order to do you know, useful calculations like solve fluid flows. So in this lesson, we're going to create a utility that accesses information about the mesh in order to compute something useful about the quality. Now, this is actually a, uh, something I wrote a couple of years ago to help with some of my own work. So we're going to create um, a utility that computes the volume ratio between two neighboring cells. A high volume ratios can be a problem for those of you doing a, a large eddy simulation. Um, if you actually look at the mathematical derivation of the large eddy simulation, uh, the governing equations, there is actually an implicit assumption that um, the operation, the filtering operation that you perform is commutative with differentiation. Now this strictly speaking is only true if your mesh is isotropic. So your mesh has no gradients in it. This is almost never gonna be true. But a number of studies have shown that this is not a problem as long as you don't have high volume ratios in your mesh. So you shouldn't have a cell with one size and that shouldn't be adjacent to a cell that's six times bigger, for example. Uh, that's likely to lead to instabilities, and it, it's a common cause of, uh, of large eddy simulations crashing. So to begin with, we're going to create this utility in a simple form, a very simple form, and we're going to use some of the member functions we learned in the previous lesson. And we're then going to see how one of those in particular doesn't work very well, and we're going to look at how we can make improvements. And this is going to introduce some ideas around um, efficiency of, 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 of your programs. So now noting the problem with um, W make files and options, uh, do people have the ability to create, to use foam new app for those of you using version 2006 or 2012? Lurafeng, Daniela, do you have foam new app? I think all of these, uh things are for the new newest versions of the foundation only. But uh, it's, these yeah, but it's have, fine. Yeah, yeah these, these certainly have been part of the foundation version for quite a few years. Uh, so you okay, no, all been uh, absorbed into all versions by now. My apologies for that. One no, attendant says uh, it's working, working for, the, for the plus versions, the 1906 ah, and the 1905. Yeah, I, thought, I thought I had tested most of this in, in several different versions. So uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Great, right. Hopefully, for those of you that, that can't, I say all the all the programs are in Dropbox for those of you that can't run these. So you can just download the codes um, and compile them. So phone new app is, um, this was part of a series of, of, of utilities that um, I think the foundation team created to try and make it easier to program in open phone. So it's, it's to try and just make life a little bit easier for you. And what phone new app does is it creates a template. So it's a template that contains um, a load of stuff that you would always have for an open phone, uh, open phone application. And it also creates the, um, the, the files and options bit for you. So for those of you that are following on, uh, both phone new app and volume ratio check is what we're gonna create. And go into that, uh, go into that new directory that it's going to create and compile it just to check that there's no errors. So what does this template look like? Well, it's, it looks quite complicated initially, but it's actually very simple. So the top line here, the top bit here in this big comment is just the standard um, open foam header that it always puts in. And then we've got a bit of information here. So we've got some includes, 
uh, we've got an uh, we're going to declare an integer main. Uh, this is to allow for a variable number of inputs. You'll see this a lot. It perhaps doesn't make a lot of sense, but, but broadly, this is just allowing for uh, multiple inputs depending on what your what your program is doing. And then, um, in line with all uh, all open firm utilities that you you'll have run, you notice at the end it always spits out the uh, the execution time and clock time, and then it says end. Uh, now, at this point, I'm just going to briefly uh, talk about this header file because you'll see this a lot and you'll use it a lot. So fvcfd, so finite volume cfd.h. Now, this is a header file that actually is a list of other header files. So this contains a huge amount of functionality, which is why you'll generally see it at the start of all of the solvers and uh, probably most of the utilities that you come across as well. So this contains a lot of header files and it's Done to reduce code duplication and make your code easier to read. So I've screenshot of what this contains just to give you an idea of some of the things that are in it. So FV mesh, uh, FVC, so this is for things like uh, an FVM, so FV matrices. These header files are associated with, um, with uh, field algebra and calculus. So for those of you using solvers, you'll use FVM, FV matrices, where you construct your, your coefficient matrices for solving. FVC, for example, forming explicit um, tensor operations like uh, gradients and divergence and things. And you've got a load of other stuff here associated with boundaries. So this, this generally will be at the start of, of most, most of your um, most of your applications and utilities. So this is what your the uh, phone new app creates. I've talked about that there. So I've I've uh, in the guide I've I've split the code into three sections just because it it broadly falls out that way. So I'll, I'll talk through each of those. So the first contains a number of header files that are necessary for the code to run, and a number of access functions are used to access necessary information about the mesh. So the first one you see is uh, is just shown here, and that's create mesh. What that does, and again, you'll see this at the start of a lot of the solvers, that loads the mesh off the hard drive. So it loads all the points, faces, owner, neighbor, boundaries, and it actually constructs the volumetric mesh and associates all of the, all of the different points. And it creates the mesh that you then work with. We've then got an access function that I've added. So we're going to declare a scalar and just call it C. So uh, just to point out the create mesh header, it creates an object and the object is of class FV mesh that you'll see a lot and it's called mesh. So from then on in, we can use something, an object called mesh. And you can see here, I've got some dots. So these are member functions. So if we read this backwards, which is sometimes the most easy thing to do, we are reading the member function size of a member function called C of our object called mesh. So that's the size of C. Now C is a list of all the cells. So we're just asking the size of C of the mesh. So how many cells are in our mesh? Now I've declared this as a constant here, const, and you'll see this all over the place. This is good programming practice. If you don't want a number to change, if you don't want anything to be able to change a, um, a value within a code, you can declare it as const and that just, this is good to prevent you accidentally overwriting something at a later date. And then we're using our info and we're gonna spit out how many cells are in our mesh. We're also going to ask for a list of neighbors. So we're gonna calculate the, um, the ratio. So for each cell, we need to calculate the ratio of the volume of that cell with all of its neighbors. So that's label list list. Now this is uh, this is something called typeset notation. So this is a list of list of labels. So you may also see this written if you watch my screen at the bottom. You may also see this written something like that. So that's a list of list of labels. Now typeset is where you can just have different notation that's a little bit easier. So I've just written label list list here. Uh, these are all described within the, the open firm documentation, which we'll try and have a quick look at later. And you'll see some of these uh, type definitions and, and different ways of writing things. Uh, you'll also notice I've used an and, which means I'm just using a reference. So rather than copying this, uh, the entire uh, list of, uh, of neighbor cells, uh, 
I'm just creating a reference to it. And this is done to reduce uh, memory overhead. And you, you'll see this all over the place as well. Again, um, users of uh, a, a programming will be, particularly within C++, will be familiar with this language anyway. What we're then going to do is we're going to loop over um, all of our cells in, um, in our list of, of, of neighbor cells. Now there's an open foam uh, thing here where we're able to use for all. Now, again, those of you familiar with C++ uh, will be familiar with a slightly longer uh, description of using a, a for loop within C++. Uh, where it's for i uh, equals zero, uh, i less than um, some value, i plus plus. Um, this is something that we use in OpenFoam uh, just to make life a little bit easier, a little bit less typing. And it's simply saying um, for all of the cells within neighbor. So this is sort of, this is our uh, index and this is what we're looping over. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to obtain the labels of each of our cells so that we can compute what their volumes are. So we're going to have the cell volume and then we're going to compute the neighbor volume here. So for each cell, we're going to get all of the neighbor information and we're going to compute the volume. Now, obviously, we would have this, this both ways round. So for each cell, you'll have a neighbor. And then when that neighbor is a cell, you will have its neighbor, which is the same thing. So to avoid duplication here, uh, we're just going to set a volume ratio to be greater than one. Otherwise, it's ignored. Otherwise, we would have twice as many values as we actually want. And then we're going to write out all of our uh, ratios to a list. And we'll see why this is a problem later. But we're going to do that for now using our append function. So volume ratio, we created... A, uh, we declared something called ratios here, which was a list of scalars, which we initially set to be empty. So each time we calculate something, we're going to calculate it. And we're going to add it to our list. So each time our list is going to become a little bit longer. And then in the last part of our code, we're just going to say, which is the maximum ratio of all of our cells? So let's compile this. So I've put it in a slightly different place. No, I haven't. I've put it in utility examples and I have volume ratio check. So again, we're going to have our wmake files and options. So we compile this using wmake. Hopefully will work. And now we're ready to test the code. So this is a utility that works on a mesh. So we need to actually have a mesh to work with. So I'm going to use the Pitts Daily case for this example. And I've, um, if you want to copy the Pitts Daily tutorial in or, or download the files I've got, I've, uh, I've modified the block mesh to make it um, not very good to, uh, to highlight what happens. So if we just run block mesh here, it's created it. And then we can run volume ratio check which was the code we've just written. And we can see we've got number of cells, 11,000, which is the same as what we got up here. And our maximum volume ratio is about 4.9. That's, uh, for those of you thinking about doing LES applications, um, that's quite high. And I will show you what I mean by this volume ratio. I'm hoping you can see this screen because I was having some difficulties making this work. Uh, I'm hoping you can see this screen. Somebody shout if you can't yeah, see it. Yeah. Screen. yeah, we can see it probably. Okay. And you can see that these high volume ratios are because I've designed a very bad mesh where we have these very sharp mesh gradients here. So for those of you doing things like large eddy simulation and detached eddy simulation, this is always to be avoided. 
Now, you notice I made a comment about the code not being very efficient, and I noticed somebody else has put something in about uh, not being very efficient. Ah, that's a different thing. Yes. OK, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to change the mesh slightly. And I'm going to create a slightly bigger mesh, but not that bigger. It's going to have 10 times the number of cells. And what I want you to notice is that this code took 0.3 seconds to run. I've now made my mesh twice the size. Let's run volume ratio check again and see what happens. So it's red in our mesh and you've noticed it's already taking quite a lot longer. quite a lot longer. So what's happening here? The code worked fine earlier, and now it's working very, very slowly. Is it stuck because it crashed? I'm beginning to wonder because it didn't take this long earlier. Still thinking. Still thinking. So you can see we've got a problem here. Our mesh isn't that large, it's 126,000 cells, and yet it's gone from taking, you can see up here, 0.3 of a second to run, and now it's still going. I'm going to leave it to run. I'm not sure how long it's going to take. So why might that be? Well, I've purposefully programmed this quite badly. Although somebody else has pointed out something else that I've, I've programmed quite badly that I, I hadn't spotted, but I'll ignore that for now. So on line 76 of this code, I used the append member function, which we used previously to add an element to a list. And what we're doing there is we're actually changing the size of the list. And what the compiler is doing when it sees that is it creates a new list with n plus one elements then copies the old list into it before adding the new data. Now, this is a very, very slow operation. And you can see it's still going. Ah, there we go, it's finally run. So it's computed our maximum volume ratio, but instead of taking 0 0.3 of a second, it's taken nearly two minutes. So this is a problem, because you can imagine if we have a mesh of many millions of elements and we want to compute this, it's going to be completely untenable. So for those of you that have done a lot of programming, I'm sure you're already screaming at the monitor that what I should have done is allocated some memory beforehand. So what we want to do is we want to try and allocate a block of memory. And I've talked about doing this here. So in order to do this, we need to know the total number of neighbor cells for each owner in the mesh. And we already know that what that is because we know that the number of volume ratios we've got is gonna be the same as the number of faces that we've got in terms of the internal volume ratios. So we can allocate a block of memory by using the, ah, that, sorry, that should be uh, italic rather than text it. So we use mesh.cf.size, cf is the number of internal faces. And we can modify the code, which I've got here in the, uh, the red blocks. And instead of declaring an empty list, we're going to declare a list which has a length, and we're just going to pad it out with zeros. So again, many of you will be familiar with this from, from programming other things. We're just going to declare a list of scalars. It's going to have that number of scalars and we're going to declare them all zero. And then what we're going to do is as we loop over things, we're going to replace each zero sequentially with the value. And then we're going to output the maximum volume ratio in the same way that we did before. So to do this, I've created a, uh, a version two. And you can see the changes I've made here where I've allocated a big block of memory. And then I append, I, sorry, I, I modify my list as I go, but I don't need any more memory to do that. So I declare all my memory at the start and then I just, populate my, um, my list. So let's compile this piece of code. 
and then we'll go back into our pits daily case. Now remember last time our code took 100 seconds or around 100 seconds to compute our volume ratio check. With our new code, it took 1.3. So you can see a very, very simple change to our code has made a very, very large difference. And when you're writing code, it's always worth thinking about this in the background, even for a relatively simple application like this, you can make life very hard for yourself by using by badly uh, using member functions inappropriately by not allocating memory. So it's always a good idea to be thinking about things like this. So another way we could write this code in a more efficient manner is to think about what data we actually need. Now, where in this code, for example, do we actually really need to store an entire list of ratios? All we need to know is what the largest ratio was. So we can just compare the current ratio with the last one we calculated. And if it's bigger, we then store that as the last one. So we can use an if statement to do that. And I've done that here. So again, now we don't need to allocate a block of memory at all. We're going to have a current ratio and that's going to be the current largest ratio. Then as we loop over our cells, we're going to ask, is our new volume ratio larger than the current ratio? If it is, then our largest volume ratio is the one we've just calculated. And then we don't need to use the max function either. Once we've gone through it, our current ratio will be the largest one. And this can, again, this can save us a lot of time. So again, I've created a version three. Uh, uh, we compile that code. And we now test this one. So again, our old code took 100 seconds to run. And I can't type. And this one takes about the same amount of time as the old one. So you can see that by allocating that memory or by not needing to store all that information in the first place, we can save a huge amount of time and our program is a lot more efficient. So what else might we want to do with this code? Well, I'm now going to introduce the idea of creating a dictionary for data inputs. So in many cases, we want to supply utilities and applications with information to tell them how to run. Again, the most obvious one, something like block mesh, it's got a load of information about points, vertices, connectivity, boundaries, and that's all contained within the block mesh dict that lives in the system directory. So to illustrate this, we're going to introduce a maximum volume ratio criterion to our application. So we're going to say if any volume ratio calculated is larger than a given value, it should store, it should make a note of that and tell us how many cells, uh, cell ratios have violated that criterion. So again, we make some modifications to our code. And the first thing we're going to do is we're going to create something called an IO object using information from a dictionary. Now, an IO object being an input output object. We use them a lot. We use them for reading information in about fields. So for U and P and um, UT, for example, but a dictionary is also an input output object. And we're going to call it volume ratio dictionary. And this is the form of the class constructor. So this is how we create our, uh, our IO dictionary object. So it's an IO object. It's called volume ratio dict. This is where it lives, so runtime. So when we run, we're gonna create a big object registry that's going to contain information about where everything is. And you're all familiar with the system directory, which is where most of these dictionaries tend to live. The IO objects tend to be associated with a mesh. Uh, that's not necessary for, for this example, but in, in general, you'll, you'll see that. And we've got two flags, so it must read. So we want to read this dictionary to get the information out of it. No write, because we don't need to modify this dictionary. We don't need to write anything to it. We just need to read some information out of it. The next modification is we need to read in our value from the dictionary. And for that, we use a function called lookup. Now, for a scalar, we have an additional thing where we have read scalar. And that's to avoid confusion with reading a label, because a label and scalar may look quite similar. And so this is to just avoid confusion with reading in a, a label rather than a scalar. So we're going to call it max ratio. 
and our class constructor for this because scalar is a class it has a class constructor this is the name so this is our object of type scalar and we're going to use this lookup so when it opens the dictionary it's going to look for a word called max ratio and it's going to read the number next to it and then once we've read that value in in our loop so we're using our current ratio and volume ratio again to try and find out what the highest one is. We're also going to see that if the volume ratio that it's just calculated is higher than this maximum ratio, we're going to use this compound assignment again. We're going to increase the number of failures by one. And then at the end, number of cell volumes exceeding the criteria, max ratio. So how many cells have failed? And so if we now go into version four, again, this is the same code I've just shown you. So if we compile that, And we then go back to our pits daily pace. If we just run it on that small mesh again, because we know we had some not particularly good cells, and we run our version four. Oh no, sorry, before I do that, sorry. In the system directory, we've created our volume ratio bit. And that's quite simple. It's just a foam file using the same standard format for all of our dictionaries. It's located in system, it's called volume ratio bit. And we know because we've created a lookup function, so our, our code is going to look for the word max ratio and it's going to read in the number next to it, which is four. So our maximum volume ratio that we're allowed is four. So if we now run our code, we can see again, this is for our first mesh, our maximum volume ratio is 4.88 and we have 57 cells exceeding that criterion. So we can see that we've used that dictionary to make our, um, our code a little bit more useful and to add a bit of functionality to it. And hopefully that's also introduced the idea of using dictionaries. OK. Um, and that's just the example of the dictionary there. So I'll just quickly go through a few questions. Now we've got to the end of that lesson. OK, so somebody's put in here often for uh, for and if loops over all cells of a domain, it can take quite a long execution time. Uh, wondering if there is any general workaround on making execution faster for such loops. Um, OK, it's quite a broad question. The thing to think about whenever you're looping over an entire mesh, the first thing to think about is do you actually need to loop over the entire mesh? And the second thing to think about is when you are querying information about meshes or about fields, make sure you aren't accidentally duplicating large amounts of data. So you'll notice in my code, I used um, the AND operator. And I used it here. So on line 50 of my first code, I use the AND operator. And what that does is it creates a reference to the data in the mesh rather than copying it. So I think often um, things I've seen before when I've been, I've been teaching this before, if people create copies of data, that can slow things down a lot. Uh, so I will try and avoid doing that. Um, I don't know if that helps. Uh, another comment here, I believe in the latest versions, they have templated lookup functions so we can use lookup scalar. Ah, that may be the case. I apologize. Um, it's important to point out, and th this references, this, this perhaps relates to a few of the comments here. Uh, there's often quite a few different ways of doing things. And th this is for general programming anyway. Um, there can be a lot of different ways of doing things uh, within programming, a lot of different ways of, of calculating different things. Um, 
for those of you that, that do a lot with this, you'll get used to ways that you like doing things. And, uh, and as new versions come out, uh, I know particularly something the foundation branch of OpenFoam have been trying to do uh, in recent years is to, um, to try and tidy up a lot of the, the code writing process uh, to make it quicker and make it a lot easier. For example, by introducing things like WMake files and options, uh, foam new app. There's also foam new boundary condition for those of you wanting to create new boundary conditions. And these, this templating of code um, makes life a lot quicker and can make life uh, a lot easier. Uh, I'm not perhaps not up to speed on all of the things. I hadn't spotted uh, the use of lookup scalar. Uh, so thank you for that. Um, person from Leeds uh, for, uh, for highlighting that. Oh, so they haven't just templated the lookup function. Ah, okay. I hadn't realized that had happened. So um, again, at the end, we'll have a bit of a look at some of the code documentation uh, to see how, how all of that works. Okay. Um, we'll move on to the final example, which is perhaps a bit more of a, a practical, uh, interesting example. Uh, we're going to look at solver development. So um, as you all know, and as you've all seen over the last few days, uh, OpenFoam has uh, a lot of solvers in it. Uh, but there's often times where um, you would want to add something to a solver or implement a new one. Your own research may have been uh, developing a new solver uh, for multi-phase problems, combustion problems, uh, for example. Um, so there, there's often times where you might want to at least modify a solver or, or create one from scratch. We're going to see a simple example of that here, and this is really going to leverage the the language that has been used to create uh, open foam. And we're going to see how we can actually add a whole transport model um, to an existing solver with only a few lines of code. So what we're going to do is we're going to take the Ica foam solver. And we're going to add an equation for the transport, a scalar transport of temperature. So temperature is going to be modeled as a passive scalar, so it's not going to influence the pressure and velocity fields. But you might want to use something like this for um, where you have um, minor temperature changes across a problem. Uh, you can also use this for uh, diffusion and transport of, uh, of say, part small uh, particles around a flow. Uh, you might want to do something like this. You see these scalar transport equations popping up all over the place. So you can see I've written it in a, a broadly standard differential form. And, uh, and we're going to create a, uh, a new solver called ICO Thermal Foam. Now, the way I'm recommending that you do this, and the way it's often better to do this in Open Foam, is rather than starting a code from scratch, if you have an existing code that is similar to what you already want, it's often easier to copy it and modify it. So what I've done here is if you copy the IcoFoam solver and call it IcoThermal Foam using the lines here, go into IcoFoam, then use WClean. Now what that does is it deletes any of the um, files associated with compilation. because so obviously we're, we're gonna create a new solver called IcoThermal Foam. So this just gets rid of the um, the files that have been created in the folder for IcoFoam and just gives us a, a cleaner uh, working environment. And then you'll, of course, need to change the name of the IcoFoam solver from IcoFoam to IcoThermal Foam. So for those of you following along, uh, if you want to do that, and just check that there's no major questions on that. No, we're fine. So the first thing to do, as we've previously done, is we need to go into the make files. So if I go into Ico Thermal Foam, you can see we need to have our make. We're going to have files. We're going to compile something called Ico Thermal Foam. It's an executable. It's going to go in the user app bin and it's called Ico Thermal Foam. You'll also notice if we now go into make options, we have a couple more dependencies. We've got all the dependencies and libraries associated with finite volume and those associated with mesh tools. So what are the steps we actually need to do in order to modify the solver? Well, the first thing to do is we need to tell the solver to read in some new information. So like the IcoFoam solver, which will read in the pressure and velocity files, we need to tell it to read in a temperature file. And to do that, we're gonna go into the create files, uh, sorry, the create fields header, this header is usually specific to the solver. And so the create 
field's header will live in the same directory as the solver. So we'll notice here, there is something called create fields. And what the compiler will do is, as there are many, many uh, files called create fields, is the first place it will look is your working folder that you're in. And if it finds one there, it won't try and find one from somewhere else. So for example, there is a create fields in the PISO phone folder, in the uh, simple phone folder. If it finds a create fields in the working directory, it won't try and find one anywhere else. So there won't be any, any problems with overwriting. So this is already here. This is going to read the transport properties. It's going to read new viscosity. So this, is, this was all here before. It's going to read in the pressure. It's going to read in the velocity. And you'll notice these are similar to the way in which we read in the IO dictionary. We have a file called P, for example, runtime. It's going to read in whatever from the current time directory. It must read and it's auto write. So the write will depend on what the control dictionary tells it to write. So what we need to add, as I've shown here, is we need to create a new dimensioned scalar. So that's another class. It's a, uh, a class based on scalar, but it has the dimensions associated with it as well. It's the thermal diffusivity, so we'll just call it DT. And that's going to be saved in the transport properties. So again, we're going to use this idea of a lookup. Transport properties lookup is a member function of the IO object, and it's going to look, look for something called DT. Similarly, we need it to read the temperature. So we need it to read the boundary conditions and we need it to read the initial conditions. So that's a volume scalar field. Again, we're going to have this idea of an IO object called T. It's good. This time it's obviously important that it's associated with the mesh. And again, it's must read and it's auto write. So it will be written according to the control dictionary. So all we've done so far is we've created some new fields and we've told the solver to read in some new information. So we now need to add this main equation to the main solver code. So the Icofoam solver just uses the PISO algorithm for those of you that have looked at it for the uh, coupled pressure velocity field. So if you open the C file with your text editor, we're going to add our equation down here. So this is just the PISO standard um, PISO loop. So I'm not going to touch this. And all I need to do is I'm going to use this very, very useful function called solve. And I've literally written the equation here. And you can see how mathematically this is written. So we have DDT of time. So time derivative, sorry, time derivative of temperature plus the divergence of the temperature with, uh, with U. And that's equal to the Laplacian DT of T. So we can see how similar this looks to our mathematical equation here. We have these three terms, although I put that one on the other side here. We're going to solve them implicitly. Now you'll notice here, again, where we talked about namespaces before, and you'll see why that's required here. We have two namespaces being invoked here. Within the PISO look, we have this FVC. And down here we have FVM, but we also have FVM here. Now, the DDT, the div, Laplacian, and grad, these have all been compiled within FVM and FVC. And broadly, this depends on, on, on what we're actually uh, computing. So FVC will explicitly compute the operation. FVM is when we are implicitly solving and we wish to construct the actual matrix of coefficients. So we're going to solve this implicitly. And so we use FVM double colon, so that's DDT within the namespace of FVM. And that's all we have to write. So that's the only change we have to make. So you can see how by using the notation and the overloading that exists and all the functionality within OpenFOAM, we can add these mathematical models with just a few lines of code. So I'm gonna compile, I hope it works. It was working earlier. And it's going to create a new application called ICO Thermal Phone. I hope 
OK, right, we are ready to test. So I've created, we've got a, a test case. This is the cavity clip so that there is a tutorial for, uh, for the cavity clipped tutorial. We'll test it with this. So the first thing we just need to do is create a, uh, a straightforward mesh. Again, this is all on the uh, in the Dropbox, or you can get the cavity clip tutorial out of Open Phone's tutorials anyway. So before we need to run this, uh, I'll briefly the cavity clip tutorial for those of you that don't know is just a um, it's a cavity with a cutout, and it's a horizontal velocity imposed along the top that induces um, a, a recirculating uh, flow. So we're going to introduce a temperature differential on the boundaries where our top boundary, so our moving velocity at the top, has a higher temperature than the wall boundaries, and we can see what happens to the temperature. So the first thing we need to do is we need to create a file which contains our boundary conditions and our initial conditions for temperature. And we can see how similar this looks to all of the others because it is, it's a, uh, it's a volume scalar field. It's initially going to be zero, it's called T. There's its dimensions. And our internal field, everything's going to initially be 300 Kelvin. And we're going to impose a fixed value of 400 Kelvin on the lid and 300 on the, um, on the walls. And this is a two dimensional case, so front and back are just um, are described as empty. Now, the next thing we need to do is we need to put our thermal diffusivity constant in. Now, you'll remember in our code, we said that this was going to be read from the, uh, the transport properties dictionary, which lives in constant. So we need to add that here. So DT, and I've just given it a fairly arbitrary value of 0 0.001. And the next thing we need to remember is we need to tell OpenFoam now how we want to solve our equation. You remember we were able to very lazily just write solve and then the equation, but OpenFoam needs to know how to solve it. And the first thing it needs to know is how do we want to discretize everything? And the only thing we need to really put in here, because we put default for our time schemes and, um, excuse me, Laplacian. So they're just going to be as written here. For the, um, for the convective terms, we generally don't use default schemes because they're the ones that can cause us some problems. So we just need to write here the div of phi t, so the, the convective term for the temperature, and we're just going to use um, linear central differencing here. Now, the last thing we need to do is we need to tell it how do you want to solve that system of equations. So we remember we've used that FVM operator, and that's going to construct our big matrix equation. And we're just going to use a smooth solver, the same as, uh, as U. And for um, some of you that get more into this, may wish to, to play around with this a lot more. Uh, in general, for uh, scalar transport equations um, that are solved, you would, you would normally use a smooth solver. And, uh, and I've set the tolerance as just the same as the velocity here. So we can now run our solver. So you can see in, zero, in our zero directory, we have our temperature file that I showed you. So with our boundary conditions and initial conditions, and they're going to be read in by the, create, the modifications we made to create fields. So we run our solver. We notice it comes straight up because we've compiled it with no errors. It's going to run. Gosh, it's running very slowly on my computer today. Everything is running very slow. Maybe that's because I'm using Zoom. And it's just going to run for half a second. So if we load Parafoam, is it going to work? It is. Why? And we'll notice that alongside the pressure and velocity fields, we also have a temperature field. So the way in which we've written this, we haven't told Paraview or we haven't written any code that tells Paraview specifically, oh, there's a new temperature field. We're making use of all of the functionality that OpenFoam already has. And because we've, we've maintained and kept that same code structure and that same use of fields and the way in which the information is saved, we, we don't need to write that much. And so if you can get your heads around how all of this works and, and, and make sure you utilize the, the structure and the constructs that exist within OpenFoam, it'll make your life a lot easier. So we can see we have our velocity field, which is our recirculating velocity here. And then our temperature field, we can see we have 
our hot temperature, and that's being slightly recirculated around. So you can see how you can incorporate a fairly simple, but a scalar transport equation, modify a solver, and you can still see all of the variables in the same way. And I've just got the same image there. So that concludes my uh, my three lessons. Um, I hope I hope there's been something in there for most people there. I appreciate for many of you it will probably be quite basic, but for those of you that have never used um, never used any done any programming in OpenFoam before, hopefully that's given you a flavour for um, the basics, how it how you can structure code, and also how you can use the the OpenFoam language as derived from C um, that allows you to, to create some quite advanced modeling with, with remarkably few lines of code. Uh, ah, somebody's just said you can't see Paraview. Apologies. Right, let me try this again. Parafoam. <laughs> Apologies. Okay. Can you now see Parafoam? Yes. No, we can. Right. Apologies for that. I'm not sure what has happened there. OK, right. So you'll have heard me rambling away, but not being able to see anything, which is useful. So all I was really showing is that we have this, um, we construct the temperature field here. And you can see you've got this recirculating um, flow, creating this sort of strange looking temperature gradient with the velocity um, going along the top here. So you can see again how by using all of OpenFoam's language that um, all of this is then read in, written, saved um, in the same way that you would, you would use your, your normal solvers. Uh, if anybody has any questions and wants to put them in, do so. Uh, there has been a few questions popping up about um, where can I get, where can I get information? Um, I've put a few links at the bottom, so um, in further reading. So uh, one place I go to get most of my information from is the source code. Uh, depending on which uh, which flavour of open phone uh, you're using, you would go to a different one. I've, I've put the link to the uh, to the ESI one as well. And somebody was asking for where can you get information about classes from. So for example, um, we use the list class quite a bit before. So let's have a look, what does it say about list? So list uh, T, so list templated. Um, uh, can you all see this? Can you all see um, an internet screen? I bet you can't, can you? Yes. You can, thanks, Tanya, <laughs> sorry. No worries. Right, so if we go into that now, uh, these are not that easy to read. So I will try and, help show you the bits that, um, that I use, if you will. So I talked a lot about member functions. So they're shown here. And the first ones it usually shows you is, uh, is the constructors. So this is how we construct an object of a particular class. And you'll remember I use different ones of these. The first time I used lists, I constructed it just with no elements. So I just put list zero. And then I used another class constructor where I had a size, which was our, um, the, the number of elements we wanted to use, and I used the number of um, faces, if you remember, and I padded it out with zeros. Now, for those of you familiar with C++, this is an example, as I understand it, of polymorphism. So depending on the information you put inside these brackets will depend on which of these constructors is invoked. So if I give list no inputs at all, it will automatically know to use the null constructor. If I give it a label, it knows to use this constructor. And again, if I give it a label and a um, size, it knows and uh, some values, it knows to use this constructor. Again, uh, this can be a bit daunting to people that haven't used it before because you think, well, how on earth does it know? Um, C++ in some ways is quite clever in, in the way that it uses this idea of polymorphism. But again, if you go to the member functions, you can see all of the ways in which you can construct list. And then somewhere down here, there's going to be more things. You'll notice we used the member function size. So that's shown here. 
set size so you can change the size of the list. So you can already see that there's, there's a lot of different ways I could have written that code. And, uh, and a couple of suggestions were put up to make it more efficient. But um, and I use the append list as well. Uh, but you can see by looking at this, all of the different things you can do. And a bit of a description is given. It's not huge, but you can see so set size, reset size of list. You'll then see all of this, and this all relates to dependencies and, and different things that use this functionality. And, uh, and this is where you can get a bit lost. But I tend to find the list of public member functions, the class constructors, can be very, very helpful, just, just so that you can see uh, how different things work. And you can see there's, 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 you'll have these for different things. So for example, um, scalar field, which I used as well, is uh, our scalar field is a, uh, a namespace reference. And that's going to come, that wasn't a very helpful one for me to give. Um, right, I won't go into that because I don't want to confuse things. Uh, does anybody have any additional questions? that you want to put into the chat. I will stop sharing my screen. How do I stop sharing my screen? Stop sharing. So, um, okay, if anybody has any further questions, I'll, um, I'll answer them over the next um, half hour.